All right, tonight's video will be discussing um, how to interpret means and variance. And so this is the, the title of your note page for this is Interpreting Center and Variability. This will be on the back side of the page that says Variability Notes that we took in class earlier in the week. All right, in order to discuss how to interpret center and variability, or means and variability, we will um, talk about density curves at first. Now, density curves is created by smoothing a histogram. And that just, to smooth a histogram, that just means drawing a loose curve to fit your histogram. And you've seen me do that with different types of graphs in our class to uh, describe their shape and, and spread and whatnot. Uh, they are always on or above the horizontal axis. All of them have an area of exactly one underneath them. And that will be important to us later on when we discuss probabilities and things um, throughout the year. These density curves describe the proportion of observations that fall within a range of values. Um, remember that's a percentage number. And that's what we're really going to be focusing on today. And they are often a description of the overall distribution because of what their shape can tell us, um, whether they're skewed or uniform or symmetrical. Those can tell us different things about the mean and the median. And they use the mu and the sigma to represent the mean and standard deviation. Remember, those represent populations, parameters. And now our discussion is going to move into something called a z-score, which we're going to be using throughout the year. And it's a standardized score. And what a z-score is helpful for is when I'm com trying to compare two of the similar, similar kinds of data, but they're measured differently. So for instance, if I want to compare an ACT score for, for someone to an SAT score, then I can standardize those scores so that um, they become z-scores and they're more easily um, comparable. And uh, this z-score will create the standard normal density curve, which we're going to discuss later on today. And it always has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. And so here's the formula for calculating a z-score. Uh, you need to commit this to your memory because we will be using it um, quite often. The z stands for z-score. X stands for your actual observation. So if I was talking about a score on a test and I made a 92, that would be my x. Mu stands for, of course, your mean, which is, you know, so let's say the class average was an 80. And then the standard deviation, remember that's your distance from the mean, is the denominator of this part. So it's a simple calculation that we're going to be using uh, quite often. So please commit this formula to memory. All right, so this slide is actually going to tell us what z-scores mean. If I do my calculation, I come up with a negative 2.3 z-score. I have 2.3 standard deviations below the mean. If I come out with a positive 1.8, that means I'm 1.8 standard deviations above the mean. So if I have a negative z-score, I'm below the mean. If I have a positive z-score, I'm above the mean. All right, now this brings us to... Uh, example problem. This is that Jonathan wants to work at Utopia Landfill. He must take a test to see if he is qualified for the job. This test has a normal distribution with mu of 45 and standard deviation of 3.6. So remember mu is the mean. And it's going to be important for us to note also that it's a normal distribution. We need to be looking for words like that and that will make more sense as we go on through the course. And then it says, in order to qualify for the job, a person cannot score lower than 2.5 standard deviations below the mean. Jonathan scores a 35 on his test. Does he get the job? And so in order to determine if whether or not he gets the job, I need to calculate Jonathan's z-score. Because that will tell me how many standard deviations above or below the mean he is. So again, my formula for a z-score is z equals the actual observation minus the average divided by the standard deviation. So again, here's the average, there's a standard deviation, and here's Jonathan's score. Those are the three numbers I'm going to substitute in my formula to calculate his z-score. 
So his score is 35, subtracting the average and dividing by 3.6. So I get negative 10 divided by 3.6. And when I uh, do that math, I get Jonathan's z-score at negative 2.778. So again, looking at our problem, it says that he cannot be lower than 2.5 standard deviations. And I found that he's lower um, by 2.778 standard deviations. Therefore, Jonathan does not get this job. No job for Jonathan. And that leads us into the discussion of the normal curve, which you've seen me draw before, just maybe not call the normal curve. It is a bell-shaped symmetrical curve, so it looks like this. <coughs> And it could be taller and thinner or more spread out, depending on your standard deviation, which we're going to discuss next. But it is bell-shaped and it is symmetrical. And uh, the transition points between cupping upward and downward occur at mu, or the mean, plus one standard deviation, and the mean minus one standard deviation. And all that's saying is that um, where you see the curve begin to come up right here, and where you see the curve begin to go down right there. That would be one standard deviation below the mean. Here's the mean and symmetrical. And this would be one standard deviation above the mean. And as the standard deviation increases, the curve flattens and spread out, spreads out. So the further you get from the mean, the further this cusping point or cupping point, excuse me, is going to be out. If the standard deviation decreases, the curve gets taller and thinner. And that's something you need to be aware of um, for true-false type questions. And lastly tonight, we need to talk about the empirical rule. The empirical rule can only be used with normal curves. So if you have a distribution that's skewed to the left or skewed to the right, or is uniform, then uh, you cannot use it. It has to be normal. Uh, bell-shaped curve. And uh, that's where our z-squares are going to come into also. But what this empirical rule gives us is a percentage of the observations of my data that are within um, certain standard deviations. And so the empirical rule says that 68 percent of all my data will be within one standard deviation of the mean. Approximately 95 percent of the observations will be in two standard deviations of the mean and 99% excuse me 99.7% of the observations are within three standard deviations of the mean. And so what we'll do at the beginning of class tomorrow is actually draw a picture um, of the normal curve with these um, standard deviations drawn in as well along with the mean and I think the picture will help you see it um, even more clearly. But that's all for our video tonight. Um, just be ready at the beginning of class to uh, begin this discussion again.